summarily um, uh, criticized for make, you know, politicizing that, and yet here we have an event, a tragic event, nine, nine people uh, executed for being Christians. That was politicized, and no mention, no mention of, of the fact that these were targeted, these individuals were targeted because of their Christian faith. Yeah. Your yeah. thoughts? Richard, listen, the hypocrisies seem to know no boundaries connected with this case and others like it. And as you have um, so astutely pointed out, uh, the, the, the disparity in, the, in, which the, uh, in, in the ways in which this is being handled through the White House. But listen, by, by now we're seven years into this administration. Th this should not surprise us. I mean, we, those of us who have studied uh, the man in the White House and the people with whom he has surrounded himself and the people with whom he has fellowshiped and surrounded himself for most of his life, I mean, he writes about it in his books. Um, it, there should be no surprise to us that the man has an agenda. And and I, I mean, I mean, I, look, I was a former cop for years. I did, I did criminal investigations for some of those years. Uh, you know, people sometimes will say, "Well, you're just a conspiracy theorist." And and my answer to that is, well, let me let me tell you, as a former law enforcement officer, I know that many many crimes begin with a conspiracy, and so. What a good law enforcement officer does, or a good journalist, as you are, a good radio host and TV host, as you are, uh, what, a, what, what, what we do, law enforcement and journalists, we take a, 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 something that has happened and we form theories and we form the, the, the basis for understanding the possible conspiracy behind this terrible deed. And then, of course, we come up, we separate the bad information from the good information until we finally come up with uh, a truth in the matter. So that's, that's what I was trained to do. And then all of my years in the ministry, I approach the scriptures the same way as I compare them to what's happening in the world around us. You know, we do a thorough exegesis of the scriptures and, and, and examining the languages and context. And then we look at what's happening around us and we pull the two together. So, so now we look at what's happened at UCC in Oregon, and it shouldn't surprise us. Listen, as soon as it happened, on my social network site, I blogged, and I said instantly, I said, I can tell you within the next few hours, Obama's going to go to a microphone somewhere, and he's going to tie this to gun control, and he's going to politicize it. Not only did he do it, but he bragged about doing it, Richard, so it shouldn't surprise us. All right, Carl, uh, you stay put, and we will uh, come back on the other And I am anticipating a deluge of uh, emails, most of it unpleasant. Uh, whenever I mention the C word on the program, uh, Christianity, <laughs> it opens the floodgates. And, you know, I, uh, that's all right. Uh, I've got um, uh, broad shoulders, and um, uh, it's a strong faith, and, and uh, I can take it. Uh, and I would not in, in any way compare... You know the uh, these this minor irritant uh, of the slings and arrows of some uh, hateful email to what happened, for example, uh, to those nine Christians that were slaughtered uh, for their faith in uh, community college in Oregon, or if we uh, dial it back to June, uh, the nine uh, souls at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church gunned down in Charleston, South Carolina, seemingly for the same reason because they are Christians. Uh, you know it's. Um, it's easy to sort of uh, to seek safe haven in that gray middle ground, but uh, to me, uh, things are ramping up and coming to sort of what my father used to say, an acute angle, and it's harder and harder to sit uh, by uh, and stay in that gray middle ground. Uh, anyway, Carl Gallops is uh, with us. His new book is called Be Thou Prepared, Equipping the Church for Persecution and Times of Trouble. Uh, Carl, I'm sure you've, uh, you know, been confronted with this question umpteen times, and it's quite frankly, it's a good question. Uh, people like Bill Maher would ask this, uh, you know, when talking, when, when, you know, taking a, a shot at religion and so forth, and that is, uh, you know, the idea of Christians arming themselves, uh, let's say, bringing guns into churches uh, to defend oneself. You know, back there's a in the Orthodox Church. Uh, during the liturgy, there's a, a point where they say, bar the doors, which harkens back to when church, the early churches in the catacombs in Rome and so forth, they were under, these, under this type of persecution. And so the, 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 uh, the congregation were, were ordered to bar the doors to prevent anyone some, from bursting through. 
Um, but it, when it comes to, again, going back to Bill Maher and, and talking about, you know, arming Christians, and is there something, you know, does that fly in the face of, of uh, the, you know, Christ saying, you know, turn the other cheek and, 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 and uh, uh, you, know, don't, uh, you know, don't slay your enemies, love them and pray for them. Is there a contradiction there? Yeah. No, thank you, uh, Richard. That is an excellent question, and as a matter of fact, I deal with it quite extensively in my book, but I look forward to speaking with you and your audience about this tonight. Um, you, you know, whether or not a, a – well, in the United States, of course, is where I live, and, and uh, with the Second Amendment rights, and so many states having concealed weapon permit or even open carry permit and the right to keep and bear arms uh, and bear arms – so we, you know, we, we have that opportunity. Most of us in America do. Most of us have that uh, choice to make. Now, whether or not someone chooses to own a firearm and or carry a firearm, it is a highly personal matter, and I don't judge a person one way or the other. If a person says, you know, I'm just not comfortable with firearms, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd rather defend myself in some other way, uh, that, that's fine. But on the other hand, again, in the United States, we, we do have that choice, and so many people do choose to arm themselves, and many Christians do. And, of course, the question comes up, should a Christian uh, carry a firearm? Should a pastor carry a firearm? In fact, a minute, uh, in a minute, I'll tell your audience uh, whether I do or not. <laughs> should churches arm themselves? Should churches have security teams, security ministries, etc.? These are all very important questions, and on the heels of... Uh, or, or on the advent of increasing persecution, if you would, or targeting of Christians, let's call it that, um, the, on the advent of increasing targeting of Christians in the United States, either the targeting like of a Kim Davis and a flower shop owner and a church, I mean, excuse me, a, 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 a cake baker for weddings, whether it's that kind of targeting by radical groups like the radical homosexual agenda in the United States, targeting those folks, or whether it's, as you said, the, the church in North Carolina or, or the school in Oregon, and, and, and both of those killers admitting, you know, that's what I'm here. I'm targeting Christians. I'm targeting uh, believers in Jesus Christ. So we have some heavy-duty thinking to do. Now, let me address this question of turning the other cheek. Uh, that's an important question. The problem with all of this is context. I want, to ex I want to address the context of what Jesus meant when he said that, according to the Scriptures, the full context. And then I want to address what Jesus said about arming oneself. He said some very profound things, Richard, some very pointed things. Now, concerning this, the, the concept of turning the other cheek, the context of that, that was spoken in the Sermon on the Mount, he's speaking to the massive crowds, and he's speaking to day-to-day -to -day living and how do we live our faith in the face of, of uh, people who would disagree with us or dishonor our faith or even abuse us because of our faith. And the basic point of the message of turning the other cheek was, look, as believers in, in Christ, as Christians, we're not here to be arrogant, uh, you know, people looking for a fight. We don't bully our way through life. Uh, we don't bow up and get offended every time somebody challenges us. At least we shouldn't. And so what Jesus is saying, look, just as, as far as it is possible with you, live at peace with the world around you. If you have to turn the cheek from time to time, you know, turn the other cheek, uh, take a little abuse, uh, you, you know, just carry, carry the code an extra mile for the person. And, of course, he was using illustrations from, from the, the culture of the day. I mean, uh, Roman soldiers could conscript, uh, conscript a person off the, off the street to carry their equipment to do things for them. And, and so what he was saying, look, he said, let's use that as an illustration. You know, you're a believer. You're a believer in God. Uh, so, so and he and he befriended Roman soldiers, the well, enemy, yeah. the sworn enemy, right? Yeah, a absolutely. And, and 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 the thing is, is he was telling people, look, don't look at people according to race or class or culture or or any of these things. But 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 you are a child of the kingdom. You have a witness for the kingdom of God. So as the day to day persecutions and hardships come your way, as far as it is possible with you turn the other cheek. I mean, and, and I agree with that. I live my life that way. Now, for people who want to get hardcore and say, no, 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 what that means is, is just let people do, 
like they want to to you, you know, in the name of Jesus or whatever you want to say, just let them do that. And I say, really, really, do you really think that's what he meant? Is that really how you live? I mean, so you're in your house tonight, you're in bed, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you hear a big explosion, and you realize somebody has just kicked your door down. They're walking, they've come into your house, there's two or three people with machetes and baseball bats, and they're headed down the hallway where your little children are. Are you going to step out into the middle of your living room and say, hey guys, I'm going to turn the other cheek, just do whatever you want? Of course not. Of course not. In fact, that would be unbiblical. That would be ungodly. The same scriptures tell us that a person who does not provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. And, of course, the word provide means everything. I mean, providing not only food on the table, but the general expectation of safety and security. No, no parent would allow thugs to kick a door down and then go to your children's rooms with baseball bats and machetes and just say, no, no, we're Christians here, so we turn the other cheek. Of course not. So the context there is a matter of, look, as far as you can, day-to-day life, don't go around with your chest bowed out. Don't go around picking a fight, looking for a fight. Don't go around looking for opportunities to be offended. That's not the way to express the kingdom of God. Rather, turn the other cheek. You know, take abuse take a little bit more and shake the dust off your feet and keep going forward. Now, to this to the topic of personal protection. I, I want to I want to share a couple of things that come from the scriptures immediately, two out of the mouth of Jesus and and then then one Old Testament example and I could give you many and all of them are in my book, but uh, it, on the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, or was betrayed, and was going to be arrested, and finally taken before Caiaphas, and, and, and then, of course, go to the cross, he told his disciples, and the context is very literal. He told them, he said, look, if you don't have a sword among you, I advise you to buy one. He said, if you have to sell your cloak or sell your sandals, he said, I advise you now to buy a sword. Now, here's the context of it. The context was he was getting ready to go to the cross. He knew. He knew everything that was going to happen. He knew that his disciples would be targeted. He knew they would be hunted. He knew that when he rose from the grave that they were going to be accused of stealing the body. He knew that their lives would be in danger and the lives of their children and their families. So he said to them, buy a sword. Now, Richard, a sword in Jesus' day 2,000 years ago was the same as a, a, a personal firearm. Sure. I mean, that's exactly what it was. It was a personal protection weapon. And, and so when you continue to read the scriptures, Peter speaks up and said, Lord, we have two here among us right now. And Jesus said, that'll be enough. Now, I always tell people when I preach that, I say, you know, the Bible doesn't say this, but I imagine Jesus smiled and looked at Peter and said, Peter, that'll be enough. We're not fighting a war here. I'm just saying right. you need to kind of, you know, don't don't go empty-handed. And when they came to arrest uh, Christ in in the Garden of Gethsemane, though, he, he uh, Peter went at the Roman soldier, uh, cut off his ear with that sword, and Jesus basically talked him in off the ledge. Oh, yeah, it, and he rebuked him. And so here, and people say, well, okay, so there's a hypocrisy. No, there's not. It's a matter of context. Jesus came to earth to go to the cross. He was going to Gethsemane on purpose, to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was going to Golgotha on purpose, the hill of the cross. He, he was headed that way. He had told his disciples that. And so the guards coming into the garden that night, they were all a part of God's plan. And so when Peter tried to thwart that and, and cut off the, the guy's ear and turn to violence, that's when Jesus rebuked him and, like you said, talked him in off the ledge and said, Peter, this is not what I meant. This is not the time or the place. I don't want you to protect me. I'm going to the cross. And, of course, he healed the guard's ear, and he told told Peter to put your sword away. This is not the time or the place. But So what he meant when he said, get a sword, and Peter said, we've got two, and Jesus said, okay, that's good. That's, that's, That's good. What he, he was speaking of just the personal protection, day-to-day, common sense. It's going to get tough, guys, is what he was telling them. And especially after the resurrection, it's going to be tough. Uh, you need to be able to protect your family. Carl Gallup's Be Thou Prepared, Equipping the Church for Persecution in Times of Trouble. Uh, just a reminder, Carl uh, will be coming to Toronto at the uh, Oise Auditorium, University of Toronto, St. George Campus, Wednesday, November the 4th. That's an evening event along with L.A. Marzulli, and it's called, as in the days of Noah, 
uh, tickets available, just go to my live events page at strangeplanet.ca. Uh, let me throw this out there, Carl, and uh, I'm not, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to ambush you here, but this is a tough one. But how would Jesus have felt, or how would Jesus feel about the Second Amendment? Yeah. No, no, listen, you, you can ask me anything you want. I don't, I don't uh, take any question as an ambush, Richard. I, I really enjoy uh, speaking truthfully about these things. Well, listen, how would Jesus feel about the Second Amendment? Well, of course, I haven't talked to Jesus about this, but I know him personally through my relationship with him, and I know the Scriptures. And, and I do know that the Second Amendment was designed, and of course I know American history, the, the, the Second Amendment was designed to protect the freedoms of the First Amendment and the freedoms outlined and, and the self-evident truths spoken of in the Declaration of Independence, and that is our freedoms come from God. And we have a, we, we have a, right, we have a right to basic self-protection and self-preservation. Of, of, of ourself, that's redundant, of course, but, but of our families, our loved ones, and, and the innocent people around us. I mean, that's a godly thing. That's a godly principle is, is for those of us who can to defend the innocent around us from evildoers. Evil exists in this world. Evil is real. I mean, look at ISIS. Look at what happened at UCC. Look what happened in North Carolina. There are evil, wicked, demonically possessed people who would set out to destroy every believer today if they could. And so the Second Amendment is just a statement of that fact. And it says, look, you know, if you, you, you have the God-given right and responsibility to defend yourself. Now, again... The Second Amendment doesn't mean that we're supposed to have arsenals to go out and start wars with people. And it doesn't mean that we're supposed to be big bullies carrying guns on us, uh, making people do what we want because we've got a bigger gun. Of course not. It's just a statement of the God-given right and responsibility we have to defend ourselves. So All right, Carl, the- got to jump in. We'll uh, take a time out, come back. Be thou prepared. Equipping the church for persecution in times of trouble. Boy, have we got trouble. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. Uh, you know, let's be clear. Uh, Christians are not the only uh, religious group uh, that is in the crosshairs of ISIS. They are targeting uh, other Muslims. Uh, they are targeting uh, a sect of the Zoroastrians, the, uh, the Yazidis. Uh, but um, the, the West has been largely silent uh, about this. And... Um, you know, it, it harkens back to uh, the end of the Second World War uh, when uh, Jews were fleeing Europe. Uh, right here in Canada, we like to think of ourselves as uh, this, you know, a bastion of, uh, of uh, uh, liberty and, uh, and so forth. And yet, and yet there was a, a member of the, uh, the Liberal Party who stood up in the House of Commons uh, when asked, you know, how many Jews should we bring into Canada, allow to come into Canada, to escape the Nazis? And the Liberal member's response was, none is too many. And here we go again. We keep saying, you know, never again, never again. And yet it is happening, not on that scale yet. Uh, but still, we are largely, the silence is deafening. Wouldn't you agree, Carl? Yes, I would. And listen, thank you for your astute observation that, of course, Christians are not the only targets of radical Islam. Uh, you're absolutely right, and, and, and the facts bear that out. But the facts also bear out, as, as you were saying when you interjected your however, uh, the facts also bear out that Islam focuses its targeting of, of the infidels upon Christians and Jews. I mean, uh, there's just no, there's no doubt about it. Now, right now, what's happening in the Middle East, of course, is a cleansing, the ISIS cleansing. They're trying to get it. It's a power struggle between various factions of Islam, and they're trying to uh, cleanse out and to get rid of any opposition they would have, even from among the Islamics, uh, who would keep them from coming to power and establishing their caliphate and establishing their ISIS, their Islamic state of Iraq and Syria, or ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which includes, of course, the whole uh, eastern portion, which includes Israel. That's what they want. And so they'll kill anybody that gets in their way, and that includes the more moderate factions or different factions of Islam. You're right. 
but their ultimate goal is to cleanse the area of Christians and Christianity and and or Judaism and the Jews, and particularly to ultimately destroy what is now the modern day of nation of Israel and to claim that land as their own. So that's what's happening. And of course, they hate the Western powers, particularly the United States of America, because we have been involved from the beginning in the establishment of the nation of Israel, along with other nations and the United Nations. But they really, really hate the United States because uh, because we are the largest Christian nation that the planet has ever seen. Now, when I say Christian nation, I don't mean that everybody in the United States is a Jesus-loving, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, church-going Christian, but we have more people in the United States claiming to be believers in Jesus Christ, claiming to be Christian uh, in one nation than, than, the, than the planet has ever seen. And of course, United, the United States has been a huge supporter and defender of Israel. So. That's what all of this is about, and, and it's very spiritual. Of course, I come from a biblical worldview. I know that uh, some of your listeners and my listeners and all the interviews I do, are, not all of them are people of faith, and I try not to be too preachy uh, when I'm on radio programs, but I make no bones about it. I'm a Christian, and, and I come from a biblical worldview. So I understand the Word of God says that we see these things being acted out in the physical realm, of course, in the human realm, but behind them are very deep and dark spiritual powers. And this really is a spiritual battle taking place, which the Word of God, and only the Word of God, prophesied, spoke of thousands of years ago. It's what my book, Final Warning, is about. And, and, and here it's being lived out. It, before us, Israel is back in the land. Only the Word of God said that that would happen in the last days. Ezekiel 38 speaks of an alignment of certain nations, Iraq and Russia, perhaps China getting involved, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, uh, the destruction of the Middle East, uh, the Euphrates River being the, the hotbed of all of that. Only the Bible speaks of that. The Quran doesn't speak of that. Uh, the Hindu Vedas doesn't speak of that. The teachings of Buddha doesn't, doesn't speak of that. But the Bible does. And we're watching it. We're the only generation in the history of mankind to see Israel return and the nations align themselves and everything happening that the Word of God said. And All right. ISIS is in the middle of it. All right, Carl, we'll take one final time out, come back and uh, finish up. Uh, we do have to talk about, uh, you know, the, a little bit about the, uh, the Shemitah and, and uh, the, uh, the prophecy yes. of uh, Sir Isaac Newton has come and gone and uh, the blood moons, etc. Uh, we'll address that as well. Carl Gallops, Be Thou Prepared, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Do not touch that dial. Go. Carl Gallops is here. Be thou prepared. Equipping the church for persecution in times of trouble. All right, Carl. So uh, we had the, the 29th of uh, Elul, which um, uh, occurred during um, uh, the Jewish New Year on the Hebrew calendar. We had the, uh, the final of the uh, blood moons and the tetrad, which was uh, you know, over an 18-month uh, span. We had these four blood moons. And uh, uh, we had, of course, the, the 23rd of September, which was uh, 23rd of September 2015, which was uh, sort of earmarked by Sir Isaac Newton as uh, the date in which some sort of major messianic event would occur. Uh, and we're still here. The sky didn't fall. No economic cataclysm, although, you know, the, the markets have been a little rickety of late. Uh, is there a danger of, um, uh, you know, the, the whole chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and it never falls? Yeah. Well, yes and no. Uh, and and th what, a, what an excellent question, and I know a lot of people are asking it. Um, it one reason a lot of people are, are asking that question, though, Richard, I'm afraid, is because there was so much hype and misinformation out there about what reputable Bible scholars were really saying about all of this. And, the, the, and, and let, me, let me let your listeners know what I mean by that, and then I want to give them a, a feel for what really has happened and what is happening. Of course, we had you know, Isaac Newton saying that on September 23rd, 2015, something messianic was going to happen, something prophetic. Well, I want to share with your listeners exactly what happened on that date and the few days before and after. It's, it's absolutely astounding. But as I said, um, listen, I, I'm, I'm a former cop. I, I've been in the ministry for 30 years. I've been a pastor in one church for 29 years. I'm, I'm a solid conservative evangelical pastor. I've never been a date setter. I've never claimed to be a prophet. I've never said, let me tell you what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And I didn't do that during any of this. But what I 
said, the illustration that I used was, look, look, look at the prophecies that are contained only in the Word of God, that we're the only generation to see them happen, and watch them converge, the ones we know, Israel's back in the land, the coalition of nations that I was speaking of, that's happening right before our eyes. Russia and China are now in the Middle East, in Syria. That's a biblical prophecy that, that many scholars have been writing about for hundreds of years. Uh, now we've got the United States turning its back on Israel. Israel is literally surrounded by enemies, some of them calling in the news daily, we want to destroy her, we want to drive her into the See, all of that is biblical prophecy before our eyes. The whole thing of ISIS and their strongholds along the Euphrates River, that's all biblical prophecy. So those things we know, and there's much more. But in the meantime, you've got the Pope coming forward, calling for the state of Palestine. You've got the United States, the largest Christian nation in the world, trashing 6,000 years of definition of marriage and the biblical definition of marriage with a Supreme Court ruling. Then you've got the Pope calling for the state of Palestine, acknowledging a state and a nation that doesn't even exist, and if it did, could be devastating to the life of Israel. Then you've got the Pope calling for a one-world governmental system, those are his words, to deal with man-made global warming. And all of these things that are happening, then, on top of all of that, you've got September, and you've got the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of... Uh, of atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, all falling within the same month, at the same time that the Shemitah cycle ends, at the same time that the year of Jubilee, the Super Shemitah cycle begins, at the same time the Tetrad of the Blood Moon ends, and then at the same time, of course, Isaac Newton, and I don't claim that he's a, 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 a prophet, but but he did make some astounding prophecies about the return of Israel and how it would all happen that, uh, he, that, that came to pass, just as he said, from his mathematical calculations. And he said that on September 23rd, something powerful was going to happen, messianic. So what I've been telling people, Richard, for the last several months is, look, I'm not setting dates. I'm not proclaiming something particular is going to happen. But here's what I'm telling you. There's a convergence that's coming like a flood of biblical end-time prophecies that are unprecedented, and they're astounding. And I liken it to this. I live on the Gulf Coast in Florida. I live in Hurricane Alley. From June till November of every year is hurricane season down here. When June rolls around, the conditions start ripening, the conditions start converging, and the weather people every day are saying, okay, we've got a low front, we've got this, we've got a high-pressure system, we've got a low-pressure system, this is a tropical storm, now this is going to be a hurricane, here's where it's going to strike. And so what we do in June, we look at the convergence of conditions, and we say, there might be a hurricane. Now, we're not going to say on what date, we're not going to say where it's going to hit, and we're not going to say how powerful, but the conditions are so right that we would be stupid not to be looking for a hurricane. Well, in the same way, we have a prophetic convergence of prophecy hurricane ingredients, if you will, and what I have been saying, as I think as a responsible preacher and teacher of the Word of God is, look what's happening, here's what's happening, Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you've got this convergence of September events. We would be stupid not to be watchful. And sure enough, people said at the end of it, well, look, the world didn't end. Well, no responsible Bible teacher was saying the world was going to end. I certainly didn't say that. What I was saying was, be alert. There are messianic, biblical, end-time prophecy things that are happening. And sure enough, Richard, September the 23rd rolls around, and what happens? The Pope arrives in America to speak with Obama, Obama with so many anti-Christian, and some people say anti-Christ spirit uh, elements about him. I'm not calling him the anti-Christ. I'm just saying he has so many anti-Christ spirit elements about him. The Pope comes over alongside of him, comes to the White House, speaks before Congress, unprecedented, no Pope has ever done that, speaks before a joint session of Congress. He is representing Catholicism for the entire planet, and in that speech he never mentioned the name of Jesus. He never mentioned the word Bible. He never mentioned the word Christian. He never mentioned the word Lord. He, he never mentioned the word abortion. He never mentioned the word homosexuality. He never mentioned the word Islam or terrorism. What did he talk about? He talked about global warming and American border laws. Then he goes to the U.N. and speaks about global warming and Palestine. U.N. raises a flag of Palestine that doesn't even exist over the United Nations 
By the way, the colors they chose for the flag represent the four colors of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, black and white and red and pale green. It's amazing. And so, Wait, uh, Explain that. I, I wasn't familiar with the four the four well i know the, the, the pale green which, which horseman is that yes um in 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 revelation chapter six there are four horsemen right that describe you know and, it, and it's and it's uh symbolic and 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 speaks of end time things and and it's cryptic and so there are many interpretations but there's the white horse i don't have the scriptures right in front of me but there's the white horse that many think uh, has to do with this antichrist spirit that sets out to conquer presents itself as a as a Christ, but really is not, and, 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 and causes devastation and wars. And, and then, of course, the, you know, the black horse representing, excuse me, representing uh, death, and then the red horse representing famine and disease and, 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 and pestilence, and then, and then the pale horse, it's called in some translations, but the Greek word there means a palish green, a sickly-looking green. Uh, the, the red horse uh, had to do with uh, famine right. and, and starvation, and the green pale horse had to do with disease and pestilence. And so these these four horsemen of the last days, the apocalypse, the, the coming of the very, very last days, are represented by those colors in the scriptures. Now, I'm, t- I'm not going to make more out of it than what it is, but I'm just saying what happened in September. You had the three major feasts. You had the ending of the blood moons. You had the ending of the Shemitah cycle, the beginning of the year of Jubilee and the super Shemitah. And we, and we should point out, Carl, that the, the markets, uh, if you look at what happened in China and in Europe, yes. uh, huge stock market uh, falls. Fluctuations. I mean, yeah. they, they, I mean, it wasn't all in one day. Right. Uh, but if you look at it over the period of uh, several weeks, uh, you could argue that we had some of the greatest uh, crashes in market history yes. during that time. Well, listen. And here's, you know, that's an astute observation, and here's how I liken it. The days of Noah and when the flood came. Well, can you imagine Noah and his family gets in the ark, they shut the door, and on the first couple of days it's raining very heavily, and, and then p- before long the, the water starts rising. But the people are saying all along as the first drops fall, well, look, we're still here. Nothing happened. <laughs> well, after 40 days and 40 nights, and then, and, and then as it continued on, uh, a lot happened, and the judgment of God fell, and the world was destroyed. So what I'm saying to people is, look, I'm not claiming the sky is falling. I'm not setting dates. I don't know what is or is not going to happen, but I'm not um, ignorant. I, of, I know the Word of God. I see the geopolitical happenings. So during this week of September 23rd, you've got the Pope. He comes to the White House. He goes to Congress. He never mentions Jesus. He goes to the U.N., and during that whole week, what else happens? Oh, my gosh. Russia is in Syria now. Then within a day or two, China is in Syria now. And I mean Syria and Damascus. Those are huge biblical prophetic places, and there's so that's, much in scriptures that's about what's going to true. happen yes. there. Listen, we, we just have a, a, about a minute and a half here. Yeah. Uh, when you come to Toronto... Wednesday, November the 4th, you'll yeah. be up on the stage uh, along with L.A. Marzuli. Uh, he'll be talking about the Nephilim, the, re- the return, the reemergence of the Nephilim, how that ties into uh, the alien abduction um, narrative and, and how that relates to biblical prophecy. You'll be talking about uh, the trumpet days of Revelation. Uh, just yeah. give us a sense of you know, what, you, what you'll be presenting. Yeah, well, there's some amazing word correlations in the scriptures and in Revelation, and found particularly in the trumpet prophecies that correlate, and again, being redundant, I'm sorry, some amazing word comparisons that correlate to precise historical events, things that have happened, some of them very recently and some in, in, in less than the last 100 years, but precise historical events that correlate to those words that and and the and the uh, elements of the prophecies surrounding those things that happened actually have happened in history and are happening before our eyes correlate to the trumpets of revelation and which many believe refer to the very very last days before the return of the lord and i've made those correlations i've cataloged and referenced that using uh, scientific sites, mi- military sites, history sites, mainstream media sites. I mean, really uh, tremendous resources. And I've taught this stuff and shown people this around the world for 
25 years I've been putting this together. This, this All right. Well, well, we'll look forward to hearing yeah. uh, more of that Wednesday, November the 4th, as in the days of Noah. Carl, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. God bless you. Be thou prepared, equipping the church for persecution in times of trouble. The website, strangeplanet.ca. As always, follow the truth.